Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Baptist Church. It's good to see everybody's smiling faces today on a beautiful day today. Uh, a few of the announcements this week. Monday at 6.30 p.m., uh, there will be a North Mac uh, uh, 2 uh, uh, meeting for uh, Vacation Bible School at uh, Pittman Hall, and there will at the, uh, not be any... Uh, uh, Zoom Bible study at that time. Uh, and then this Wednesday, uh, the act, there will be no activities at the church, April the 13th, during Holy Week. And then Thursday is our Monday, Monday Thursday uh, service at 6 p.m. Uh, in the sanctuary where we will observe the Lord's Supper. So I invite all of our uh, Christian friends to, uh, to come in and, and uh, be there for, uh, for Thursday. It's a very special time. It's a little bit different. And then Friday is our, uh, we have Good Friday service, at, uh, and that will be a, a community service at the uh, First Christian Church in Girard, and that will be at 6 p- p.m., and Pastor Mark Doan of the Verdon Methodist Church is in charge of that service. And then, of course, Sunday is our Easter sunrise service at the First Christian Church at 7 a.m., And then Sunday school here at uh, 9 a.m. And Easter Easter worship service led by Kyle Hawkins here at at 10. And and I'm having breakfast today. Oh, and Jan says that she's... I'm not just having breakfast. (laughs) Jan's having breakfast at 8. And she invites you all to come along and have breakfast with her uh, at 8 o'clock here at Pittman Hall. And then uh, Saturday, uh, 423... Uh, the, the widow and widower social uh, meeting will be at 2 p.m. at, at Pittman Hall. Uh, be sure to check the bulletin board in Pittman Hall for uh, events sponsored by other area churches and organizations. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes, Helen. Okay, that, that's uh, the Tuesday ABY Women's r- uh, Group w- Rally. Rally. And uh, if you're interested in going to that, see Helen. Okay. Okay, birthdays and anniversaries this week. Happy birthday today to Jim Smith. Happy birthday, Jim. He's here. Uh, happy birthday. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Wrong Jim. <laughs> But he nodded. (laughs) You nodded. (laughs) You're just being kind to me, I know. Uh, Happy birthday tomorrow to Sophia Hawkins. Sophie's here. And happy birthday on Thursday to Cindy Burris Bates. Happy birthday on Friday to Jenna Cormier. And happy birthday on Saturday to Leanna uh, Painter. And her sister is here. Lillian? Liliana, okay. Uh, I didn't do well in phonics, as you can tell. Uh, If there are no other announcements at this time, let's prepare ourselves as uh, as we have the uh, the video up on the screen.
clap your hands and wave your arms. Play the drums and then rock the guitar. <laughs> uh, our call to worship today is too many people want to have Easter without Calvary. And uh, so true. Uh, let's stand and sing hymn number 628, He Touched Me. seated. And at this time, we will dismiss our young people to uh, Children's Church. Okay, right this way. And at this time, I believe we have an announcement by uh, Jill Wright. there. Um, just wanted to take some time to talk about a training that our insurance company actually, this is on behalf of the diaconate board, um, our insurance company reached out to us and told us about the mandated reporter training. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, um, but it's something that by law, anyone that works with children needs to have done this training. So this is required for everybody in the church that works, um, you know, that leads our our children's church lessons, whether it be on Sunday or on Wednesdays, um, but it's also something that the diaconate felt we should encourage everybody to, to do this. And basically what it is is a training to protect children um, that, may, that we may suspect um, have, are being abused or neglected or in any form. Um, and so that's something that we wanted to wait till for the most part the kids were downstairs. Not really something we wanted to talk about in announcements, but um, it's just an online training. It takes about 40 minutes. It's pretty easy um, and, and just something that we encourage everybody to do. Uh, it's one of those things, you know, we may think that 
all the kids that come to this church, or we may not interact with kids a whole lot, um, but, you know, it is something that happens in this community, and sometimes in this church. In the last year, I've actually made a call to a, a child that said some things that were concerning and, and very unsettling, so it's, it's not just a social, social responsibility, but also something that we're called on is to pre- protect all of God's children that we may, um, you know, suspect might be um, abused or neglected, so uh, if you have any questions, reach out to the diaconate board. We will get some information out about um, with that link that you can go to to do this, and it's just kind of on your own time. But if you do work in a capacity with this church to where you teach children or, or with children, we will be following up with you just to make sure that you completed that training. And um, if you have any questions, just reach out to me or anybody on the diaconate. Okay? Anybody have any questions right now, actually, while I'm here about this? No. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jill. At this time, we'll, we will prepare for our offering. If our ushers will prepare. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can call you Father and be intimate with you. We thank you for loving us. And Lord, uh, we ask you to bless these tithes uh, to, for your will, Lord, to go out to uh, help others to uh, spread the gospel message. And Lord, help us to um, be a part of that in our personal lives as well as we give uh, to you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You remain standing, let's turn to hymn number 292, Because He Lives.
Amen. You may be seated. Go to the Lord in prayer. I'll let, I'll let you pray silently for a while, and then I'll join in. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to say thank you, to praise you, to lift you up, uh, to, to remember the importance of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us and made us right with you, Lord. Um, we, we thank you that, uh, that we have this uh, time, of, a special time to uh, make Easter special. Uh, not only to us, but to the, to the world, that we can emphasize that and maybe uh, touch others who need to know uh, of your love for us. Lord, we just uh, want to thank you th uh, for being with Steve and, and Vicki as they uh, uh, went through some hardship to uh, um, get to Texas, and we just thank you that uh, Steve has been blessed to, to have a trial to go through a trial and continue. Um, Lord, and I know uh, our prayers will need to be constant and that you hear us, Lord, no matter what, in times of trouble and times of joy. And Lord, we thank you for Marvin, that he is uh, recovering, and uh, we just pray that he continues to recover so that he can um, um, be around to enjoy his grandchildren and family and to be uh, a beacon in this world as well. Lord, we all have concerns and maybe unspoken concerns uh, with family, uh, with healing, and we just ask you to uh, continue to lift them up and, and give them uh, hope, Lord, um, and, and, and be the comforter in times of hardships. Lord, we go about this day um, hopefully depending on you uh, for everything that we do. And Lord, we know that when we do, that you will bless us in return and give us that living water. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to turn the service over to Miss Becky Law. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I checked with Libby to make sure there was something or nothing I should say or not say today. <laughs> but congratulations to you all. It's here. To, it's it's good to know. It's good to know that um, you're going to have somebody steady in here for a while to be able to fill the pulpit, and and um, that's a praise. That's a praise for all of you. Uh, if we could, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask for your anointing over this service, and I just ask God that you search my heart. Father, as I am just nothing but your delivery girl here, God, and I just pray that, that you would just cleanse my heart, my mind, my words, and that, God, that you just pour out your Holy Spirit through me upon each of us, that we leave here a little more changed and ready to go out and not only be hearers of the word, but doers also. Be glorified, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, Palm Sunday, it marks the beginning of what many would re refer to as Holy Week. And, you know, if, if I, I was thinking, even, I've thought about this before, and actually the sermon I'm going to give today, I kind of combined, I did a series a few years ago about the villains of Easter. So I've had to kind of strip it down and put it all together for one day. So... Um, to try to, to try to get it all here today. But one thing I found is that this whole week, there is so much that happens. I think, I think somebody could really make a long series out of this, this week alone because of all the things that will happen and take place. So I'm going to try to, to fit as much in here today as I can. This week begins with Jesus riding into Jerusalem, the great city, and, and he comes riding into town, and the people can't wait. 
they've heard about Jesus, some of them have seen the things he's done, and, and they've heard of the miracles and, and everything that's going on. And, and here Jesus comes riding into town on not just a donkey, but a colt of a donkey, one that had never been ridden, which was a sign of purity. A donkey, a sign of peace. And you have people waving palm branches, praising him, singing Hosanna. And I think about this. How many of us, if we were called to be a deliverer, you know, if, if we're, we're coming to deliver everybody, now come on. In today's society, wouldn't we want to roll into town in and, and a, and a Porsche? Or, or, or something, you know, just something, we, you know, we want to look at me. And he comes into town in the most humblest of ways. Jesus in that day could have come in in a grand chariot. He could have come in riding a white stallion as this great warrior hero, right? That's what the people wanted. And instead, they got a carpenter on a donkey. You know, the people wanted somebody to deliver them from Roman power, and Jesus comes into town saying to love your enemies. You see, sometimes what we need and what we want are two very different things. Most thought that Jesus was going to come into Jerusalem and he was going to overthrow Roman power and establish an earthly kingdom right here. But Jesus, what he couldn't get them to understand was he was trying to make a way for a spiritual kingdom that would last forever. And so, Jesus doesn't give the people what they need or what they want. He gives them what they need. And so, I want to ask you this question today. Who is Jesus to you? Is he someone that you're looking to to satisfy your selfish needs and goals, your selfish wants and goals? Or is he your Lord and Savior Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the one to whom you know has cleansed you from any and all wrong? See, Jesus would go on throughout this week. He would wash feet. He would share a very special meal with his close friends, his disciples. He would be betrayed, arrested, denied, and crucified. And today I want to focus on the villains of Easter. And I'm going to start in Mark 14. And I'm going to go read verses 10 to 26. It says, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted when he had come to them, and they promised to give him money. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. And as we know, opportunity presents itself, and Judas betrays Jesus. Now, I want to ask you something. Have you ever wondered why in the world did Jesus choose Judas? I have many times. But then I got to ask myself, why would Jesus choose me? I want you to imagine Michael Jordan He gets the opportunity to pick the greatest basketball team of all time. It reminds me of one of the boys. You you guys have an Xbox game, right? Which one? NBA? Which one is it? 2K22? Something like that. Yeah. And so if they they really want to get their team, it allows them to go even back in time so they can have Larry Bird playing with Steph Curry all on the same team. And they can really create what they feel is the greatest team of all time. And so, I want you to imagine this. Michael Jordan comes rolling into town. He's going to pick the greatest basketball team of all time. And you have all the greats there. All the way down from, you know, you got Larry Bird, you got Magic Johnson, you've got Kareem, you've got Steph Curry, I'm not going to name LeBron. Um, You've got all of these people. (laughs) You've got all of these greats. And you have a front row seat to it all. 
And as they announce Michael Jordan coming in, the crowd is roaring and they're cheering. And he's walking through and he's examining the line of greats. And then he pushes through the crowd of greats and he looks at you and he looks you in the eye and says, I want you. And the crowd's cheer goes to, huh? What? Maybe, maybe you can't even play basketball. And maybe you say, I can't even play basketball. And he says, I don't care. I want you. And you think to yourself, like, that would ever happen, right? But you see, that's exactly what happened. God pushed through the crowd and saw you, and he said, I want you. It's exactly what happened. He chose you, and he chose me. And, and even the Bible says in 1 Corinthians verse 1, 26 through 29, he says, God chose the things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise, and he chose things that are powerless in order to shame the powerful. Basically, he's saying God's choosing the things that don't make sense to the world. And if the world doesn't make sense to you, it's because we don't belong here. Amen? Jesus saw potential in Judas. He did. And he gives us the same opportunity to follow him as he did Judas. See, Jesus chose 12 disciples and one chose to become a traitor. Because, you know, I'll tell you, one thing that troubled me for a long time, years ago, when I would be thinking about Judas, I'd be thinking, well, did Judas ever have a chance? He did have a chance because Jesus didn't need a betrayer. He was going to go to that cross regardless, amen? Amen. It was nothing to do with the decision Judas made. Did Jesus know? Yes. But just like he knows every one of us that well, that intimately. Jesus loved Judas. Come on now. And you know what? This might baffle some of you, but you know what? I believe Judas loved Jesus. They spent three years together. This was the close group, and they spent three years together. And you might think, well, how could he do that to him then? Well, let me ask you something. It wouldn't be betrayal, would it, if it wasn't someone close to you? It wouldn't be betrayal. I believe they loved each other. I just believe that Judas loved the world. His loyalty wasn't to Jesus. His loyalty was to the world. See, even though Jesus knew exactly what Judas was going to do, he still washed his feet. Now that's love. While scripture tells us that Jesus chose him and it would fulfill the prophecy, it was not God's will for Judas to turn away. And we can blame Judas, but he's not the reason that Jesus was crucified. As I just said, He didn't need a betrayer because he was going to go to the cross regardless. God created Judas, like all of us, with a purpose, and it was not to betray him. Now, we don't know exactly what was behind the motives and the decision that Judas made. Possibly greed. Judas was the treasurer of the group and was known to dip into the purse from time to time. And we also know that he received a bribe of 30 pieces of silver. So perhaps it was also his lack of patience. Judas accepted the bribe, but I really don't think he knew exactly what was going to happen to Jesus. Jesus tried on many, many occasions to explain to the disciples what was going to happen, and they didn't understand. Either they weren't listening, they were men, or... They just didn't get it. And so I think, like, like many of the others, Judas thought, you know, he's going to come in, he's going to overthrow the Romans, everything's going to be fine. And Judas got impatient, and he tried to take matters in his own hands. And when Judas realized what was going to happen and Jesus was going to be crucified, he was filled with regret. And he tried to return the bribe, but it was too late. And Judas would feel such great shame 
and guilt, that instead of allowing it to draw him to Jesus, he allowed that condemnation to overwhelm him so much that he ran out and he commits suicide. And you think to yourself, what a wasted and pitiful life. You know, Judas, Judas could have had this great ministry. He could have had treasure in heaven. And I want to say this, Jesus, Judas knew Jesus. But he never knew Jesus as Lord. And there is a difference. Satan knew who Jesus was. Many people might say they know Jesus, but is he their Lord? And so overcome by greed and selfishness, Judas' life is, is very much a tragedy. He wasn't devoted to Jesus. He was devoted to the world. And so I want to ask this. Are we true disciple, disciples and followers of Jesus, or are we pretenders? Because Judas was religious, but he was lost. And he's an example. Judas, we can look to as an example to examine our own commitment to Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is a Judas in all of us. When we, like him, refuse to trust God in his plan for our life. There's a Judas in all of us. And the truth is, you and I have both betrayed Jesus. Maybe not for 30 pieces of silver, but we've betrayed him to our own selfish desires. And we have sold Jesus out from time to time. And so when we choose the things of this earth over Jesus, we're much like Judas. Another person, another villain I want us to take a, a, a quick look at, and that's Pilate. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. You see, some might say that he's responsible for the crucifixion. Because when Jesus is betrayed and arrested, he's sent to Pilate, who examines him. Pilate's the only one that has the power to sentence a criminal. And the Jews are wanting Jesus crucified, but they don't have the power to execute. And so Pilate, Pilate has the power, and so he questions Jesus, and we find, and, and he finds him innocent. And in Mark 15, starting in verse 6, it says, The Roman governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration was to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release the prisoner as usual. And he says, well, would you like me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. They realized by now the leading priest had arrested him out of envy. But at that point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. And Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call king of the Jews? And they all shouted, crucify him. And Pilate says, why? What crime has he committed? But they shouted even louder, crucify him. And wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had him flogged, I'm sorry, and he had Jesus flogged, handed over, and crucified. And so now we see from the beginning of the week where they're praising Jesus, they're now yelling crucify him because he did not give them what they wanted. And so we ask, how could someone... How could someone in power who finds this man, Jesus, innocent, want him crucified? You see, Pilate didn't have a good relationship with the Jews. They didn't like each other. And he was afraid that if the Jews would riot, they would go to Rome and he could possibly lose his job. And so you see, Pilate had a choice in the matter, just like Judas had a choice in the matter. And we will find that every one of us has a choice to make about Jesus. We all have to come to a point where we make our own decision about Jesus. You see, because of what others thought and what others wanted, Pilate decides he's going to wash his hands and close his eyes. And you know, we do the same thing when we want to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to the things going on in the world rather than taking a stand for Jesus. 
So in ways, we can find ourselves much like this villain Pilate. Because what is popular is not always right, and what is right is not always popular. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ, because it's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. As Christians, we should desire to be morally right rather than politically correct. Just because society is going to tell you something's okay, or it's now a law in this state, does not mean that God approves of it. Pilate listens to the crowd, and a man named Barabbas gets released, and Jesus gets sentenced to crucifixion. Barabbas is a well-known criminal, another villain. He deserves the punishment he's about to get. The crowd would rather see this hardcore criminal released than Jesus set free. And so, can you imagine if you're Barabbas? He's waiting to be executed. This wasn't the first time that Barabbas was sent to prison, but at this point, he's pretty certain it's his last time. And all of a sudden, the prison door swings open, and there stands a Roman guard. And he says, Barabbas. I mean, can you imagine the fear that must be running through his body? This man has sentenced to die by crucifixion. And the fear that that man, you know, here a dead man walking. And all of a sudden, the Roman soldier says, Barabbas, you are free to go. A man named Jesus is taking your place. You know, one thing, you know, we know that Barabbas deserved what he got. He didn't deserve to be set free. And have you ever thought what a cold-blooded murderer like Barabbas and yourself could have in common? Jesus jumped in and took our place. Romans 3.23 says that every one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Yet God freely and graciously declares us righteous because Jesus freed us from the penalty of sin. You know, the great news is it wasn't just Barabbas' sins that went to the cross that day. Barabbas wasn't the only prisoner set free that, that day. You and I were released as well. And it wasn't just forgiveness that was bought that day. We were redeemed. We were declared righteous, and we were healed that day. It was all paid for 2,000 years ago. I want to encourage us as we go into this holy week, I want you to remember Jesus 100% God, but 100% human. And let me, let me ask you this. If you found out you only had a little time left to live, would it change the way you live? I asked Brian this a while back, not not too long ago. I said, if you found out you had little time, would it change the way that we lived? And you know what he said? He said, do you want what should be the correct answer, or do you want the honest answer? The honest answer is, I think every one of us would say, well, yeah. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we should say no. (laughs) We're living for Christ right now. Jesus is going through this week, entering, knowing the turmoil that awaits. Knowing that that his closest allies are going to betray and deny and and desert him. And he's 100% human and 100% afraid. Even his own father on the cross will forsake him for a moment. Let's remember that as we go, as we go. And maybe we remember on Friday what that precious blood accomplished. It's far more than forgiveness. It's far more than a ticket to heaven. There are things that were accomplished on that cross that can come alive in us today. 
Healing can be ours. Now, God gives us medicine. Amen? But he is the way. You know, um, a clergyman was talking to this Christian woman once and says, do you really believe that deathbed repentance can do away with a whole life of sin? And the lady says, no, I don't. But I believe Calvary does. I want you to uh, picture this. There's this bus driver. One afternoon, this bus driver is driving about 40 kids home from school. Okay? Now, the bus is making its way down a steep grade. And the brakes failed. Now, he can't turn left because there is this large embankment. And if he goes right, there's a cliff. And so as the bus is hurrying down this hill, the driver recalls that at the bottom of the hill, there is a narrow gate to an open field. And he thinks to himself, if I can just steer this bus down this hill into that field, eventually this bus will come to a safe stop. And so here he is hoping and praying that, that there's no cars and obstacles to get in his way. And as the bus is hurrying down this hill, the driver sees the gate approaching. But to his horror, he noticed a small child sitting on the gate, waving at the bus. Now it's too late to change the plan now because the driver, to avoid the gate, will kill 40 innocent children. So he cried out in anguish, as the bus slammed directly into that gate, the innocent child died instantly in the collision, and all the passengers on the bus were safe. Emergency vehicles are at the scene. Parents and grandparents arrive. So grateful to this bus driver. Many of them are going to the police saying, you know, where's the bus driver? We want to thank him for what he did for us and for our children. And the police officer says he was taken to the hospital. He's suffering from, from, from great and severe shock. And everybody says, well, that's understandable. And the police officer says, no, you don't understand. That little boy on that fence was his son. See, when it comes to the crucifixion, we can argue that it was Pilate. We can argue that it was the Roman soldiers. We can say it was the crowd that turned on him. We can say Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. Or we could just take responsibility and say it was our sins that put him there. But you know what? As I was thinking this week, villains or not, it doesn't matter. His love for us drove him to that cross, and nobody was going to stop him. So what we find is that Judas, Pilate, Barabbas, the crowds, they're not the only villains. We're the villains. We're all villains, but through Jesus, we're rescued we're given a whole new identity. And this is the only story that you will find in history where the hero comes to die for the villains. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for you and for me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you so much for what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. And we take it for granted. We do. If, if we didn't, Lord, we wouldn't sin like we do. And once again, we ask for your grace and mercy to pour over us. We ask that we enter this week with, with a mindset of knowing it was not an easy week for Jesus. He was scared. But his love was so much greater than any other emotion for us. That nothing was, and no one was going to keep him from that cross. And we praise you for the celebration that is awaiting next Sunday. 
And we praise you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, We're going to sing 458. Take my life. 458.